So we'll spend, you all have until about 1 o'clock? Yes. Yeah, so we'll spend about, um, and I apologize again, it's pretty nasty outside. Uh, but nasty is relative, right, after what we've dealt with in Southeast uh, United States and Texas. Uh, so first world problems. Um, so we'll spend about 30 to 35 minutes um, listening. I'll, I'll chat with you all, and then we'll spend a few minutes, if you'd like, on a brief question and answer clarification session so you all can return to your 1 o'clock duties. I appreciate the introduction, and um, I'm very thankful to have the opportunity to, to speak with you all today. A lot of times we um, think that, and we've been taught to think for generations up until very recently, that sleep is almost non-essential. And we have ironically glorified um, those people, professionals, type A personalities, who um, say that they can function on little to no sleep. Um, so, you know, I remember when I was in medical school, one of my um, favorite mentors of all time is a trauma surgeon, internationally renowned, uh, fantastic human being, actually happens to hail from Suffolk, Virginia, and I uh, still have a great relationship with him, trained at Harvard and um, uh, the biggest county hospital in the Midwest at Cook County in Chicago. And I remember him saying, and then folks like him saying with various degrees of um, expression, that um, he was proud to be able to function on little to no sleep, three or four hours a night. And when we look at the lives of um, highly accomplished personalities or highly productive people, um, often we have a tendency to, um, again, glorify the idea that sleep is almost non-essential. But we've learned a lot about sleep, which is a relatively new subspecialty in medicine as a whole over the last 20 years or so. Uh, you all probably have heard about sleep labs or sleep doctors. They've only been around for about 30, 35 years. Um, and during that time, um, quite a bit of literature has exploded, uh, almost literally, from an epidemiological perspective, from a human behavior perspective, and perhaps most importantly, from a wellness and uh, disease management or care management perspective. So what we've learned to come full circle that we will probably spend the rest of this talk uh, focusing upon is that sleep is in fact not only n not non-essential, it's fundamental and it's essential to human existence, to homeostasis or balance or equilibrium, and actually to optimal wellness and performance um, physiologically, uh, behaviorally and in terms of mental health. Um, when we think about sleep, let's just kind of crude it down and say that there are three aspects of sleep that we should be very attentive to. Quantity of sleep, which we'll talk about, quality of sleep, and then timing of sleep. And any interruption in any one of those particular fundamental pillars can lead to other undesired consequences having to do with quality of life and longevity itself or expected lifespan. So let's start with quantity of sleep. We've heard um, before when we were growing up that you need to get your eight hours. And then we've heard, as I talked about a few minutes ago, that maybe you don't really need eight hours and those people who are super performers can get by on two, three, four, five, six hours. So what we have learned after doing it the scientific and more detailed way is that in fact we all pretty much need eight hours, so grandmother was right. Um, when we say eight hours, it doesn't necessarily mean eight hours on the dot, but when you look at the spectrum um, of um, ethnicities in the human population, it actually gets very, very close to eight hours on the dot. Uh, when we, if you remember from school, there's a Bell or Gaussian curve of distribution, and we have outliers on both sides that comprise two to five percent of the population. So about 90 to 95 percent of the human population requires right around eight hours of sleep as adults. And then there are the outliers. There are the short sleepers, I know it's a very technical term, who uh, can actually function optimally with no known deleterious consequences on their health or longevity with six hours, maybe five to six to six and a half hours a night. And on the other end of the spectrum, there are folks who actually need more sleep. Again, they make up a very small percentage of humans. But as adults, they may need, for instance, nine to 10 hours of sleep a night. Um, <clears throat> The need for sleep changes, as you might expect and have experienced firsthand through the course of um, the human lifespan. 
As babies, we're born to need about 20, 22 out of 24 hours of sleep. And then as we get older, that total sleep need decreases. By the time we turn about four or five, around the time that we commence school, pre-K or kindergarten, we drop the afternoon nap, even though it persists at later uh, in life in other cultures, we call it siesta. Uh, and there's a reason for that too. There's a physiological reason that a good portion of the human population can function well with a little afternoon uh, turbo nap or power nap. Um, but by the time we're about five or six years old, we should be sleeping for about 10 to 11 hours a night. We should eliminate the daytime nap for the most part. And between the ages of five and 12, if we are sleeping that much on a regular basis when it's dark or at nighttime, uh, we shouldn't have any sleepiness at all during the day. So if your child, grandchild, nephew, niece, whomever uh, that you are aware of is feeling sleepy and is between the ages of 5 and 12 and is getting enough sleep at night, uh, that's absolutely abnormal. And in fact, we're, uh, it should warrant a referral to a qualified sleep specialist. Uh, as we approach our preteen adolescent years, the total sleep again drops a little bit, but our high schoolers should be sleeping eight and a half to nine and a half hours a night. Um, it is normal in the teenage years to have a little bit of what we call a phase delay, which means, and you probably have all dealt with this, when you want your high schooler to go to sleep at 9.30, and uh, despite the fact that all the gadgets are shut off, uh, back when I was growing up, um, it was Palm Pilots and um, instant messaging on AOL, and now it's um, smartphones and just about everything is connected uh, in a mobile capacity. Um, but if you remove all the stimulants, all the environmental elements, and you ask your teenage child to go to sleep and eyes closed and room dark and a quiet surrounding not next to a subway station, um, then if the child can't go to sleep for 30, 45 hour, hour and a half, uh, that's not abnormal. There is a good portion of the uh, human teenage adolescent population that has a natural phase delay and can't actually go to sleep until 10.30 or 11. Uh, but then we're waking our kids up so they have to go to school and be ready for the bus or get to school at an uh, ungodly hour because they haven't gotten that eight and a half to nine and a half hours of sleep. And so Mary Karskadden, um, who is a, a world sleep expert in the Northeast United States, close to where I trained in Connecticut, um, talks about this perfect storm of adolescence in which we have um, these physiological factors that don't allow children to be able to actually, or adolescents, to be able to go to sleep until a certain time. And then they have to wake up for school, and then they come on Friday, and they crash, and they wake up at 3 p.m. on Saturday, and we're like, oh, well, you know what? They probably recovered all the sleep debt they accumulated during the week. Well, simply, they actually don't recover all that sleep debt, and it ends up kind of being filed away in a little virtual folder at some point in the brain, and then it ends up having its own set of consequences down the road. Should they not be sleeping in? That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that you can't recover five days of school sleep debt by sleeping extra for that proportionate amount of time on a Saturday or Sunday. And so um, there's something to be said about maybe uh, delaying high school start times. And if you all are curious about that, we can talk about a study that was done close to Yale at, uh, at Wilton High School in the county of, or the area of Wilton, Connecticut that demonstrated some uh, unexpectedly significant outcomes about what happens to academic, athletic, and behavioral performance when you delay start times at high schools by just one hour. You don't change the coaches, you don't change the teachers, you don't change the curriculum, and SAT scores go up by more than 10%, GPAs go up, uh, administrator teacher complaints go down by over 85%, and the school wins three state championships in sports they've never competed in beyond the local level before with nothing else changing. So, we have more and more data, including in the Commonwealth of Virginia in the last couple of years about how delaying start times may be what's on the horizon. And you all know that I've been sending you information about how other states are looking at and other cities are looking at implementing that type of change. Um, but that's a subject for another day. The point here is that um, at that phase in, in life, that there is a certain uh, existential requirement of quantity of sleep, timing of sleep, um, and then beyond the adolescent teenage years, young adults typically will still require eight to eight and a half hours of sleep. By the time we're middle-aged adults, uh, again, right around seven and a half to eight hours, 15 minutes of sleep per night. And then as we get beyond the age of 55 to 65, with a little bit of variability between um, men uh, versus women, 
we still need about seven hours of sleep a night, if not more. So that's quantity. In terms of timing, um, we are built as humans to have um, a normal period in which we start to feel sleepy and then go to sleep. It coincides with the release of a hormone that all of you have heard about. It's called melatonin. Melatonin is the hormone of darkness. Unfortunately, it's popped with melatonin pills and supplements way too often for the wrong indications. The FDA doesn't regulate melatonin, so one milligram of melatonin by one manufacturer may not be one milligram of melatonin. It may be closer to three milligrams or less than one milligram, but people will say just pop a melatonin. It's natural, so there's really no problem with it. Uh, but in fact, it's not necessarily effective for a lot of stuff that it's prescribed or, or advised for. So we have something called the dim light melat or dim melatonin light onset, which is about three hours before our natural biological or biophysiological bedtime. Um, and then we have this period that we're supposed to be sleeping during, and we call that period nighttime, which is the most technical way to say it. Um, and then we're supposed to sleep for, as adults, about eight hours. And then we're supposed to wake up and start to feel alert and stay alert for that period of time that we call daytime. When we have to fight that cycle, which is related to the release of hormones like melatonin, and then um, light is the most prominent cue for what we call the circadian rhythm, which many of you may have heard about, which is our day-night rhythm that we're built with. So we have a circadian rhythm that has um, peaks and troughs, and then we have what's called the homeostatic drive to go to sleep, which is over the course of the hours of the day starting to feel more and more sleepy as we approach bedtime. So that's more of a linear, and the circadian is more of a peak, lull, peak, lull. So we have two dips in alertness in the circadian rhythm. The times in the 24-hour cycle in which we're most likely to feel not alert or sleepy. And those are 3 to 5 a.m. and 3 to 5 p.m. And guess what's the highest incidence of motor vehicle accidents in the 24-hour cycle between 3 and 5 a.m. and 3 and 5 p.m.? Um, so when we have to fight that day-night circadian rhythm cycle, we end up, uh, unfortunately, unknowingly, inviting potential disaster. When we look at, for instance, night shift or third shift workers, those people who have to probably, for financial reasons or financially advantageous incentives, work the night shift, when we look at what happens to their quality and quantity of life prospectively in the future, what we see is that those people end up having a much higher incidence than non-night shift workers of things like high blood pressure, diabetes, obesity, heart disease, stroke, mood disorders, and then premature death. Average lifespan of somebody who's a night shift worker for beyond a few years is cut by seven to 10 years compared by somebody who wasn't a night shift worker. And then quality of sleep, which is probably what we should focus the majority of the rest of this talk upon because that's where we talk about things like sleep disorders. Um, if you're sleeping eight to eight and, a half, eight and a half hours of sleep per night during the period of time that we call darkness and you're in a quiet room and you have no distractions and uh, you wake up and you don't feel refreshed or you start to feel sleepy or you have the speaker talking to you about sleep and you start to feel like you want to nod off or it's after lunch and you feel like it's normal for you to feel a little bit less alert. All of that is abnormal. Doesn't matter who the speaker is, doesn't matter what time of the day it is, no, it doesn't matter if you had a heavy lunch or a light lunch. We are supposed to be, we're built to be alert, vigilant, mentally, physically uh, active, um, and poised, if you will, for about 16 hours out of the day, which we call daytime. So what that can signify, more often than not, is an unknown underlying sleep disorder. So what we go back to is the definition of sleep, which is the reversible state of being unconscious, right? So uh, during sleep, because we're not aware of what's taking place, we may not be aware of what isn't taking place or what shouldn't be taking place. And sometimes we'll hear people will bring their spouses or bed partners in and say, he did this or she did that. And we're like, no, I, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, you're, you don't know what they're talking about because you were unconscious. But in fact, we see spouses with black eyes and the husband swears up and down, I promise I didn't mean to punch, I didn't kick, I didn't, I'm not, do, I love you, baby. And she's like, no, but you were punching me. And that's a disorder. It's called REM sleep behavior disorder. And it's not too uncommon. And it can signify another underlying disorder, a neurological disorder, sleep-related breathing disorder, or something else. It can be the side effect of antidepressants. 
So um, then we have other instances where someone will say, well, my husband or my wife snores or chokes or stops breathing or coughs or gasps or, or it's worse on the back or it's worse after alcohol or it's worse when he or she is fatigued or exhausted. All of that is abnormal. And we swear up and down because we don't know that we snore. How often do we catch ourselves snorting awake, right? But all of that is abnormal. And what happens is whatever it is, the interruption that takes place during sleep, whether it's because of breathing or something else, what that does is it interrupts the brain's ability to get adequate rest and to get the stages of sleep that probably many of you heard about. You've heard of REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep. And then there's non-REM sleep. I know this is really technical, but it's actually really straightforward. So there's non-REM sleep and REM sleep. Non-REM sleep has three stages, N1, N2, N3. And then there's REM sleep. N3 is what we call deep sleep. REM sleep's not actually deep sleep. REM sleep is actually active sleep. In REM sleep, our heart rate, our blood pressure, our body's physiology are almost like when we're awake. So in fact, when we have sleep-related breathing disturbances during REM sleep, we have things like heart attacks and strokes. So when we look at the incidence of people having heart disease, arrhythmias, heart attacks, strokes, sudden death during sleep, guess when it almost always occurs? REM sleep. Oh, and by the way, guess when sleep apnea is worst? REM sleep. And so we'll talk about sleep apnea because that's probably the most important thing that you can hear today and stuff that most of us probably haven't heard before because of our preconceptions or usually our superficial knowledge about this condition we call sleep apnea. The point is that quality of sleep has so much of a fundamental imprint on the quality of wake. And as a culture, just like we want everything at our fingertips for instant gratification, just like the newest and latest and greatest smartphone has a complete screen with face ID and all this other stuff that we consider to be cutting edge technology, but the, the core of which is instant gratification, we have a very similar approach to the way that we deliver healthcare. For healthcare, we wait for complaints, we wait for problems, we wait for symptoms, we wait for things to break, and then we go into damage control mode. There's a pill or a shake for just about every complaint or symptom. Blood pressure's too high, pills for that. Blood pressure's too low, pills for that, believe it or not. Blood sugar too high, pills for that. Blood sugar's too low, shakes and pills for that. Ironically, can't go to sleep, pills for that. Can't stay awake, pills for that. Geez, there are multi-billion dollar companies that have built an enterprise around sleep deprivation. We happen to know them as Starbucks, or Five Hour Energy Drink, or Red Bull, or Mountain Dew, or Mountain Dew Extreme, as if Mountain Dew wasn't enough. <laughs> Can't get it up, there's a pill for that. Stays up too long, there's a pill for that. <laughs> you name a symptom or a symptom complex, and we've got a quick fix for just about everything. But the question is, are these quick fixes actually fixes? Or are they just Band-Aids? Because if you came to me as a patient, and I were your family doctor, and you said, Dr. Barot, I have a fever. And I said, well, why don't you take Tylenol or ibuprofen? That's probably going to control your fever. That's why those medications are FDA approved, to treat things like high temperature. But if the source of your fever is strep throat, and you have a bacterial infection in your throat, and I'm not getting to the heart of the problem, and I'm giving you pills like, or over-the-counter medicines like Tylenol and Advil, am I treating the problem? I'm treating the fever. Well, let me take you, let's just reorient the axis a little bit. What if high blood pressure is the fever? What if diabetes is the fever? What if cardiac arrhythmias are the fever. Stay with me now, because we have ample proof that that's probably the case. We have drugs for high blood pressure. We have algorithms to treat high blood pressure. The American College of Cardiology has devised an algorithm to treat high blood pressure that most doctors subscribe to. You're African American, you have a blood pressure of over 140 over 90 millimeters of mercury, you get a thiazide diuretic. You start at a low dose, you go up to tolerability, to the maximum dose, blood pressure's still not controlled, you add 
a beta blocker or a calcium channel blocker. That doesn't work, maximize the dose, still tolerate it, add. You all have heard this, you've seen this, this is how we practice medicine. In no way is this a negative reflection on my colleagues or what we do. The point is that we have enough in our armamentarium to understand that maybe we're just popping pills, but we're not asking questions about the triggers. So let's take high blood pressure, hypertension, the most prevalent chronic medical condition in the United States. How many people do you know, either you or someone that you know very well, has been diagnosed with high blood pressure? Raise your hand if you don't know somebody who's been diagnosed with high blood pressure. <laughs> Good. So there's enough anecdotal proof in this room to know that blood pressure, high blood pressure is very common. How do we treat high blood pressure? We prescribe these medications. We have these algorithms. African Americans, thiazide diuretics, non-African Americans, angiotensin receptor blockers, or ACE inhibitors. We have this, your doctor is really good at what he does. He's very thorough. He says, okay, your blood pressure is now above this level. We need to treat it because we don't want you to have complications from high blood pressure, or we don't want your blood pressure to get acutely or suddenly too high, because that can cause things like strokes. So we're going to prescribe this medication. I want you to get a home blood pressure monitoring kit. I want you to check your blood pressure a few times a day. I want to see you back in three months. Let's check a log of your blood pressures. Let's look at your medication. Let's see if your blood pressures are controlled. These are the most common dangerous side effects to look out for if you take this medication. If you develop a cough or swelling of your lip or a, a rash, I want you to stop the medication, call my office immediately, and tell my nurse. Does that sound familiar? What if I told you that the number one identifiable cause of high blood pressure, according to the Joint National Committee on Hypertension, which is the nerdiest blood pressure doctors you can ever think of. They do nothing but study high blood pressure. And they're scientists and researchers and epidemiologists, epidemiological uh, experts, internists, cardiologists. For the last 12 years, they have published consensus statements. The number one identifiable cause of high blood pressure is sleep apnea. How many times when we get the pill and we get the, the follow-up, and we get the instructions about the side effects, do we get asked a few questions about our sleep? If you want to volunteer, is anybody in this room, does anybody have a history of high blood pressure? Were you asked about your sleep? No. Anybody else? Any relative of yours, have you accompanied anyone to a doctor's visit where they were treated for high blood pressure? Raise your hand if you've ever done that. Were they asked about sleep? Okay. Number one identifiable cause of high blood pressure, obstructive sleep apnea. We're talking about asking five or ten questions with a background. <laughs> you can get it. All right? So now the question is, well, okay, high blood pressure is caused by sleep apnea, but what happens when you treat sleep apnea? Does blood pressure go down? So let me first take you on a quick journey about the natural history of high blood pressure. And some of this may be in the little cartoon that I allowed you all to take a look at. And you're welcome to take those home. And you're welcome to do more research. And you're welcome to look it up. You look it up and it's there. We just don't know to look it up. Not just us. Healthcare providers don't know to look it up. When we're in medical school, do you know how much instruction we get on sleep and sleep apnea, it's less than an hour in four years of medical school. And to this day, the majority of medical schools are teaching students that hypertension or high blood pressure, 90 to 95% of the time is essential hypertension. That's the technical term for it. There's an ICD-9 or ICD-10 now code for essential hypertension. It's probably put in your medical records or in medical records I don't know, a few hundred thousand times a day, essential hypertension. And we're told that maybe five at the most, up to 10% of patients who have high blood pressure may have secondary hypertension. And so we look for secondary hypertension in unusual circumstances. Young people diagnosed with blood pressure. People who are older than they should be when they're first diagnosed with hypertension. Young females. And we get these studies. We're told renovascular stenosis. That means blockage of the arteries that supply the kidneys. We're told about unusual endocrine tumors like pheochromocytoma. We're told about these disorders like primary hyperaldosteronism. 
We're told about oral contraceptives causing high blood pressure. <coughs> and yet, obstructive sleep apnea is present in over half of people who have high blood pressure. It is on the Joint National Committee's list as the number one cause of hypertension. And we don't ask a few questions about sleep. You're started on this pill. Pill is maximized to the highest dose that's allowed and tolerated. Then what happens? Invariably, eventually, whether it's a month or a year later, started on a second pill. Start low, go slow. We all follow that dictum. And what third? So what's the average amount of time that it takes to be on the first pill until the time that you're on three or more blood pressure medications? About five years or just a little under five years. And by the time you're on three or more blood pressure medications, you're called drug-resistant hypertension or difficult to treat high blood pressure. And in 2001, which was eons ago in sleep medicine, because I told you the field is only a couple decades old, in 2001, Dr. Logan and his colleagues did a study of people that we knew. By then, he and his colleagues knew that, because this is all they study, they knew that sleep apnea and high blood pressure have a strong relationship. And he had also noticed that there are plenty of people who are drug-resistant high blood pressure who end up having a diagnosis of sleep apnea when the questions are asked. So he said, well, forget about snoring and choking and obesity and thick necks and race and whatever, muscular neck and all this stuff, forget about all that. Let's just take everybody who's labeled as difficult to treat hypertension and let's just do sleep studies on all of them and see what percentage of them have sleep apnea because we're not asking the questions but maybe the answer will allow us to ask the right questions. In 2001, when our technology wasn't anywhere as close to being as sophisticated and sensitive and accurate as it is 16 years later, what percentage of people had sleep apnea if they were on three or more blood pressure medications? 83%. If you look at it now, it's probably closer to 100%. So he did a follow-up study a year and a half later. Same Journal of Clinical Hypertension. So what happens when you treat sleep apnea in people who have difficult to treat high blood pressure? And what they found is that there is, by using this little CPAP device, so they used to be bigger and noisy and bulky and Never would you, uh, would you by mistake call this thing sexy, but <laughs> times have changed. I wouldn't call it sexy, but the new CPAP machines are just a little bit bigger than this. And the new masks, like the one that I use every night, just plugs into your nose. Doesn't make any noise, and we'll talk about that if you'd like to in a few minutes. So what they found was that when you treat for four hours a night, 70% of nights, which is Medicare's compliance criteria, so they pay for your machine and supplies, which for us, is not, that's not really, for us, it's like you want to be using it 90% of, of the time, seven, eight hours a night. But the point is, what they found is even with that little usage of CPAP, average blood pressure went down more than any class of blood pressure medications could, could affect. Then the American Heart Association, the American Heart Association, everybody's heard that. They're the most credible organization related to heart disease in the world. The American Heart Association published a, a nice landmark study that demonstrated that not only does blood pressure control significantly improve in people who have sleep apnea when you treat the sleep apnea, so you need maybe less medications, lower doses, and so on, but in people who are prone to blood pressure problems, that they're pre-hypertensive. You don't wake up one day and have high blood pressure. You don't wake up one day and have diabetes. You may get a diagnosis of it because you went to the ER and you had blurred vision and you had changes in urination and appetite and fatigue and so on. And then the ER doctor does your blood sugar check and says, ma'am, your blood sugar is 540. You have diabetes. But you didn't wake up one day with a blood sugar of 540. It started out lower. And before it was 126 milligrams per deciliter fasting, which is the diagnostic criteria for type 2 or adult onset diabetes, it was 122, it was 118, it was 108, it was 101, it was 95. Does anybody know what the normal blood sugar fasting glucose level is? What do you all think it is? 100, 110. We don't get an alert until it's over 126 milligrams per deciliter. It's, it's, it's actually supposed to be less than 75 to 80. But before we're diabetic, we're pre-diabetic. So if you look at the United States population of people who are diagnosed with diabetes, it's around 30 million people. 
in the next 20 years, guess how many people it's going to be? Over 100 million people. What do you think those 70 to 80 million people are doing right now just waiting to wake up with diabetes? They're lumped into this category of people who are pre-diabetic. Just like before you have high blood pressure, you're pre-hypertensive. So what the American Heart Association said in this article is that if you identify and treat sleep apnea in people who have high blood pressure, not only will you significantly improve blood pressure control, but if you screen, identify, and treat people who are pre-hypertensive, you can prevent the onset of high blood pressure. That means you don't need to treat it. That means you don't need prescription medications, specialist visits, blood work, expensive tests, and increasing cost to an employer for your employee health plan with your own out-of-pocket contribution going up as well. The Wisconsin Cohort Sleep Study, the Sleep Heart Health Study in the last 15 to 20 years have demonstrated in addition to that fact about high blood pressure, diabetes. When you treat adult onset or type 2 diabetics, which is 95 plus percent of people who have diabetes or sugar diabetes, when you treat diabetics for sleep apnea, not only do you, is anybody here familiar with diabetes? Has anybody heard hemoglobin A1C? That's the long-term marker of what your blood sugar control is like. That's what your doctor checks every few months to see if your pills or injection or, or, or insulin injection are working or your diet and exercise plan. Not only does treating sleep apnea reduce significantly your hemoglobin A1C and improve control of your diabetes. But if you're pre-diabetic and you're identified and treated for sleep apnea, you can prevent the onset of diabetes. Got a pill for that? You got a shake for that? How many people who are at risk for or have diabetes are asked a few questions about sleep? You want to hear the funniest irony? What percentage of people do you think who complain of insomnia or difficulty falling and or staying asleep? What percentage of people who complain of insomnia get a pill to treat insomnia? And you've heard of these pills, Ambien, Lunesta, when the drug patent wears off, Ambien CR, Lunesta CR, or XR, extended release, or ER, flavor of the day. What happens when you get these pills? What are the side effects of these hypnotic medications? Headaches, confusion, memory loss, daytime sleepiness and drowsiness. The most technical way to phrase it is not feeling uh, but you feel uh. You feel confused. You feel disoriented. And by the way, elderly people who get these medications are more at risk of falls, and other catastrophes, including driving accidents. As if it's not bad enough that we have to watch out what's going on around us on the road. As if it's not bad enough that over 60% of commercial drivers have moderate to severe obstructive sleep apnea, and then 95% of them are undiagnosed and treated. And so how many of you have been driving and seen somebody in front of you, behind you, or to the side of you, where the vehicle kind of veers off and then corrects? What do you think's happening? It's either the smartphone, distraction, or alertness, right? It could be completely physiological and nobody's asking the questions. And of course, commercial drivers don't want to be screened for and treated for sleep apnea because they think they're going to lose their CDL. Not true. If you're identified and treated for sleep apnea, in as little as two weeks of demonstrating that you're being treated and using the treatment, you can safely resume driving privileges and have your CDL restored. But we have, you know, what is it? Ignorance is bliss, is a folly to be wise. So we just turn a blind eye to all this stuff. Why aren't our doctors, why aren't we asking questions about sleep when we know that treating sleep apnea can prevent the onset of diabetes? Why do we treat high blood pressure? Why do we treat diabetes? The simple answer is end organ damage. The blood pressure in and of itself is not really a problem. Yes, it signifies that your arteries are becoming stiffer. Yes, it signifies that uh, over time, you're going to create something called atherosclerosis, which you all have probably heard of, which just means thickening and stiffness of the arterial wall. But the problem with high blood pressure, the problem with diabetes, is that over time, they increase your risk for damaging organs that rely upon oxygenated blood. What are those organs? The heart, 
heart attacks, arrhythmias, heart failure, strokes, the brain, strokes, two types of strokes, ischemic, where the arteries block off, or hemorrhagic, where the arteries rupture, the kidneys. Why is diabetes dangerous to the kidneys? Because diabetes causes kidney failure. It causes leaking of protein into the urine. It causes the normal barrier to break down because of the accumulation of and damage from toxic substances over time related to excessive blood glucose or sugar. So if anybody knows anyone with diabetes, the danger is kidney failure and then dialysis and then eventually need for a kidney transplant, which typically isn't received and people die from kidney failure. What's the other danger from diabetes? Heart disease. What's the other danger? Stroke. What's the other danger? Blindness. What's the other danger? Wound infections, loss of immunity, amputations. So we treat diabetes with pills and injections and diet and exercise programs, which usually don't work. Why? Because all we're looking at is diet and exercise and not even paying attention to sleep, which is the third leg on that stool. But what are we really trying to accomplish? We're trying to change the slope of the curve. Once you're diagnosed with diabetes, guess what percentage of your, the pancreas is the organ that produces insulin. Insulin is the hormone or chemical that controls and regulates blood sugar. So the problem with diabetes is that you don't have effective insulin to control your blood sugar. By the time you're diagnosed with diabetes, what percentage of the pancreas, the beta islet cells that produce insulin, what percentage of that portion of the pancreas is gone or wiped out? About 90%. So now we're talking about pills and injections and diet and exercise for a 10% reserve. Well, how much can you get done with a 10% reserve? What if you're identified when you're pre-diabetic or at risk for diabetes, you have insulin resistance, you have glucose intolerance. Well, how much of a reserve do you have to work with then? Maybe 20, 25, 30% reserve? That's a lot of reserve compared to 10% or less. By the time you roll into the ER and are diagnosed with diabetes because your blood sugar is 700, you probably don't, don't even have 5% reserve. You, you put on insulin right off the bat. So the point is that when we look at these chronic conditions, what's the prevalence of sleep disorders in them? Over half of people with high blood pressure have sleep apnea. We know it. it's probably in my estimation and in the estimation of the cutting edge sleep epidemiologists, epidemiological folks, probably over 95%. But hey, I mean, I'm taking a pill. What does it matter? I'll figure it out when it happens. Diabetics. What percentage of type 2 diabetics have underlying sleep apnea, usually undiagnosed? According to the International Diabetes Federation 10 years ago, 58 to 72 percent of diabetics have underlying sleep disordered breathing. How many diabetics are asked a question about five questions, 10 questions about sleep? What percentage of, everybody's heard of congestive heart failure or heart failure? Probably the most expensive chronic medical condition in this country. And by the way, the chronic or long-standing or long-term medical conditions in total take up how much of health care dollars? Health care is now at 20% of our GDP. And we have a broken system on top of that. What percentage of health care dollars are consumed by these chronic medical conditions? 75 plus percent. Less than a quarter of the time is your health care actually expensive because of things like broken bones and acute trauma and car accidents and gunshot wounds and all of that. Most of the time, the expenses are related to things like heart failure. Heart failure is the most expensive chronic medical condition in this country. Number one cause of heart failure, high blood pressure. What percentage of people with congestive heart failure have underlying or coexistent sleep apnea? 100%. How many people here have a relative, family member, friend, somebody they know with congestive heart failure? I want you to go home and ask those people today, have you been asked questions about your sleep? And I will bet my medical degree that hardly anybody, if anyone, is told 
that when you treat sleep apnea in heart failure patients, you not only improve six different spheres of quality of life, which by the time you have advanced heart failure, that's all that matters, because you can't walk five steps without getting short of breath. But in people who have earlier, what we call class one, class two heart failure, treating heart, on, across the board, if you treat sleep apnea in congestive heart failure, the average improvement in what we call the ejection fraction is 8%. It goes from 33%, I mean 25% to 33%. Go and ask somebody who has heart failure, what would you do to have an absolute 8% improvement in the pumping function of your heart? Atrial fibrillation, anybody heard of that? The most common malignant cardiac arrhythmia that we know of, it's when, in the interest of time, just to oversimplify it, uh, we have four chambers in our heart. We have two chambers on the right side that take the blood from all the organs of the body that needs to be oxygenated the right atrium, the right ventricle. That blood is pumped from the right ventricle to the lungs. Take you back to high school, middle school, elementary school. The lungs oxygenate the blood because we inspire oxygen. And at the alveoli level, which is where the blood exchange or blood gas exchange occurs, we get oxygenated blood go from the lungs to the left side of the heart. Left atrium, left ventricle, right? And the left atrium, you, so everybody knows this. You remember lub dub? All right, so pretend the lub is the atrium, the dub is the ventricle. Pump, pump. Left atrium squeezes, pumps it into the left ventricle, which opens through the valve. You've heard of, every, anybody ever heard of heart valve replacements or heart valve disease? The valves are the, ch are the gateways between the chambers. So they're important too. So you take the lub, <coughs> it pumps, you empty into the dub, and then the dub takes the ventricle, takes blood through the aorta to the rest of the body, including the coronary arteries. The coronary arteries are the ones that get blocked when you have a heart attack. So atrial fibrillation is when instead of lubbing, the atrium kind of quivers. It doesn't pump properly. And over time, the blood, instead of pumping into the ventricle, it kind of stagnates. And it develops clots instead of being liquid blood, if you will. Pardon the crude expression, but I think that helps you understand it. When it quivers and those, that blood stagnates, you get blood clots. And when those blood clots get pumped out to the rest of the body, you get things like strokes, because they travel from the heart to the brain. What percentage of pe people with atrial fibrillation have underlying sleep apnea? Over 80%. Another study just published this week that I might have sent you guys. 80% of people with AFib. There are some very astute cardiologists who treat arrhythmias like atrial fibrillation who will not do the procedure to treat the atrial fibrillation. It's called an ablation procedure until they get a sleep study on that patient. Why? Because when you treat sleep apnea in people who have recurrent atrial fibrillation or atrial fibrillation, you significantly reduce and can eliminate the recurrence of the arrhythmia just by treating sleep apnea. Yeah, you can take a pill for your rhythm, you can take a pill for your pump, you can take a pill for your pressure. But why are we, I'm not saying that those are all band-aids, they're all important. But why are we not asking the fundamental question? So I'm going to go through quickly a list of the chronic medical conditions that have an intimate first degree relationship with sleep apnea, which is probably the most important sleep disorder you need to hear about today. And if we want to do a follow-up talk, we can talk about other stuff all you want. These are the chronic medical conditions that are linked to and probably caused by completely, almost, sleep disorders like sleep apnea, high blood pressure, diabetes, obesity, atrial fibrillation, congestive heart failure, sudden cardiac death, coronary atherosclerosis or heart attacks, memory loss, mood disorders, sexual dysfunction, cancer. You ever heard of any of those? Why are we not asking the question? I'm not saying that sleep or sleep apnea treatment is a fix for everything. What I'm saying is we know it's related. We know they're related intimately. We have enough data that sleep plays a causative role. And so when we've looked at quantity and timing and all we're left with is quality, why are we not asking a simple few questions about sleep quality? Because if we do, it changes not only sleep quality and can potentially improve our relationship with our bed partner, and trust me, save marriages, yes, it does. <coughs> have you ever heard of people who have to sleep in separate bedrooms because one of the bed partners snore? Everybody's nodding head, yes. 
We've all heard this. We've dealt with it. We've had people who come into the office when I was seeing patients who would start crying and saying, you saved my marriage for something that's otherwise as simple as loud snoring. Why are we not asking these questions? Because we not only sleep better, but then we wake better and we live better. And at some point in time in the future, if you'd like, we can do a talk on sleep and wellness and why when we think about wellness, we shouldn't just look at diet and exercise. But in fact, we, per we specifically need to look at sleep as being a third critical pillar. We'll talk about the details of diet. We'll talk about the details of exercise. We'll talk about the details of sleep. If you all would like to have that conversation. I have left two minutes on the clock. <laughs> and I apologize for the late start. And I can be here for another 10 minutes, or maybe five or 10 minutes. But I'd like to um, see if anybody has one or two questions. And if not, then good for you. Yes, ma'am. What's the relationship between sleep and obesity? You want to open that can of worms? Uh, <laughs> so we used to think that to have sleep apnea, you had to be obese. What we've learned now is that it's tough to lose weight, almost impossible to lose weight, if you have a sleep disorder. Obesity is a complicated phenomenon. And obviously, it's not all behavioral, because people don't wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to get fat today. Today I'm going to go eat at Kentucky Fried Chicken, Taco Bell, Burger King, and I'm going to do what it takes to make sure that I don't lose weight. If you have that issue, you've got a mental health problem in addition to your obesity, <laughs> right? So it's not that people don't want to lose weight or don't want to be obese. It's that maybe they're prevented from doing that because of their own physiology. In, in short, and we can talk about this in detail, there are three primary fat metabolizing hormones cortisol, leptin, ghrelin. These hormones are responsible for metabolism of fat and release of cortisol, which um, releases blood sugar, glucose itself. There's an appetite suppressant hormone, and there's a hormone that curbs cravings for fats and carbohydrates. Those hormones are distorted when your sleep is interrupted. And so you don't properly metabolize fat. You become abnormally hungry. And when you're hungry, you don't want leafy green vegetables. You want the starch-rich, fat-rich foods. So there's that behavioral, the secondary behavioral component to it. And then there's the mechanical component. There's something called the satiety hormone. Satiety, the root is sat or satisfaction. So the hormone that makes you feel like you're full. Normally, if you don't have this issue, within a few minutes of you actually being mechanically full, you feel like, all right, I'm full. When you're sleep deprived or you have a condition like sleep apnea, there's a significant delay in the release of that hormone. So instead of maybe feeling full within three to five minutes of actually being full, it takes 20, 25 minutes. And then by the time you realize you're full, you've already eaten that much more. And the stomach being a distensible organ expands. And then it happens again. And then it happens again, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. And so what's the surgical treatment of medically complicated obesity? shrink the stomach pouch, gastric bypass, bypass it, the stomach itself, so that you can't eat as much. Does it work? Temporarily. What happens when you don't treat things like sleep apnea in addition to it? It comes back sometimes with a vengeance. It's all distensible. So obesity is a complicated phenomenon. There's a physiological component, there's a behavioral component, and there's a mechanical component at the very least. All three are related to sleep and sleep health. Does that help? Yes. Is it possible to wean off of the ambient after you've been on it, along with the blood pressure at the same time? So I'm glad you asked that question, because the second part of that is, so what percentage of people who have complaints of insomnia get an insomnia medication? About 90%. What percentage of people who complain of insomnia actually have primary or psychophysiological insomnia for which those medications are FDA approved and indicated? Less than 10%. So we're treating 10 times the number of people with pills who don't need the pills, and the pills have side effects, including life-threatening ones. So more often than not, to answer your question, you don't even need the pills. More often than not, you need to ask the question, because insomnia is almost always a secondary phenomenon. And women, in particular, have insomnia from things like sleep apnea, where men have more hypersomnia or excessive daytime sleepiness. 
Men tend to be more prominent snorers. Women don't necessarily snore as loudly as men. But women who do snore have an independent increased risk of three to four times of heart attacks, strokes, and sudden death just from snoring. So if you have insomnia and you're a woman and you've been prescribed Ambien, those are red flags. You probably should get a sleep evaluation from a qualified, trained sleep doctor. And I would almost bet that you don't need the, the Ambien or the sleep aid medication in the first place. Even if you've been on it for a long time. Especially if you've been on it for a long time. Fair? All right, we'll stop because of your schedule, but um, Nancy, I will count on you all to let me know if we'd like to do something again yeah, soon. Yeah, I think we should do a follow-up. Yes. 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 We'll let you know when. Sure.